with one of our key headliners, uh, John Hennessy, and um, most of you will know him. Uh, he uh, is the chairman of Alphabet, uh, which is obviously Google's parent company. Uh, before that was president of Stanford University uh, and was um, founder and CEO of two uh, equally iconic uh, startups here in Silicon Valley, MIPS Computer Systems, uh, which introduced risk architecture, and Atheros acquired by my former employer, uh, Qualcomm. Please give a very warm welcome to John Hennessy for joining us. Thank you. Uh, the way it works now is John and I will have a quick fireside chat um, and we will try to draw in your questions. So please kindly go back into Attendify and give us your best Q&A questions. Uh, I should mention uh, mea culpa as it were. I believe some of you are having Wi-Fi access, yes? Uh, and that is because up here on this particular Wi-Fi node, we have about 100 accounts. Uh, so if you're having trouble, please try to log into the one for the downstairs floor. And if you're still having trouble, please beg one of your American friends to go through their phone hotspot and free up some capacity, right? But our apologies, but there is not much we can do. It's the computer museum that controls this. Uh, but please try to give us your best question. So far, so good. Okay. Let's dive in before we ask uh, our next panelist to come and join us. John, uh, you are at the helm of arguably uh, the most powerful company uh, on Earth. Uh, I don't think that's an overstatement. When it comes to AI innovation, um, uh, you know, commonly when people ask uh, what are sort of the richest portfolios of AI researchers and research projects, even people in academia say uh, number one is Google, right? Um, and, uh, and so you're at the forefront of that innovation uh, from Kustoff and Hauke and Andy. We heard a lot about uh, the economic aspects. We, we drifted into the social aspects a bit. And I want to drift a bit more and ask you, you know, as the leader at the helm of Alphabet, where is the connection between economics and ethics, right? Uh, we, I think, you know, we, we definitely need to look at economics because we want entrepreneurship. But where does ethics come in here? Where is that responsibility part? Why do the two belong together? Well, they certainly belong together. I think we, we, we kind of think of a set of ethical guidelines, principles, so to speak, when you, you think about this. I think there are some obvious ones. Certain things uh, are beyond the limit of what you would do. There is no monetary value you would consider, just as, for example, in the West, we don't sell human organs. Um, so there are, there are a set of things like that that I think form a hard boundary. Then there are a, a much larger set of difficult things that have to be wrestled with where there are potentially un unknowable, unforeseeable implications, unintended consequences, so to speak, bias in AI, how might you use it, uh, how, does, how, how does the data set affect what kind of decision making goes on. Um, those are things that I think, quite, quite frankly, w w Google's still wrestling with, universities are still wrestling with, society's still wrestling with. Um, we accept, we accept the fact that humans are biased. We somehow think they put their bias aside when they make decisions. But any psychologist you talk to will tell you that, in fact, they can test and show that humans are biased in their decision-making processes. Because humans are biased, all the data we collect is inherently, inherently has some bias to it as well. Sorting that out and figuring out how to deal with that so that the technology um, advances human well-being rather than reduces it is going to be the hard thing. Got it. Okay. So now you're you're the leader on top. How do you in, how do you uh, implement and then enforce ideally uh, mechanisms that would weed some of this out? Right. Bias is normal. It's in the data. Yeah. It's there. How do we get to it? And how do you like what what's the set of rules wh whether you quote Google or other companies that enforce that that doesn't happen? Yeah. So first of all. When I'm the leader, see, I work, in, I work with an upside-down pyramid. The leader is at the base supporting all the rest of the people doing the real work, right? So that's true, whether, that's true for me whether I'm, I, I was president of Stanford or whether I'm chair of the board uh, of Google. We're trying to enable people to use that technology. 
Um, they certainly have to think about the bias issue. It's, it's perhaps one of the things we confront fastest. Um, and there are ways to deal with some of these. So for example, there's been a lot of work, uh, people exploring using AI systems to determine who should be paroled uh, based on the possibility that they will commit another crime and end up going back into jail, be a recidivist. Um, so there are certain things you probably don't want to consider, like race. You probably do not want race to be a factor in that, even though you might say that in some cases race is a factor. But there are other things. Has the person held a steady job for an extended period of time? Is it likely they'll be able to go back and become employed? Because people who are employed uh, have much lower rates of becoming uh, second offenders. So, but of course, that, that does add an element to the question of making that decision. And now figuring out, is that a fair element? Is that an unfair element to consider? And it, it, does the AI system overemphasize the importance of that element somehow? So uh, the, the key thing to understand is a machine learning system can actually increase the bias that's in the underlying data. And that's something you have to explicitly test for and check against uh, in order to get, because you don't, want the, you don't want the algorithm enhancing the bias. Some of the bias is probably accurate because it's real world measurement, but you don't want the AI system emphasizing. And we talked about trust earlier, right? What would make members in the audience trust that Google does that well? Like, do you have mechanisms like uh, some kind of governance structure or audits or expert committees that look at that stuff? Well, we have the, uh, the AI principles are the starting point and an uh, internal uh, committee of people that govern those and that help interpret them. Because, of course, when you have a set of principles, uh, they are at the high level, figuring out how they apply to a particular case um, and what is considered a reasonable extension or use of the technology and what's considered an unreasonable use uh, of that technology. I, I don't think this is going to be an easy problem. I think this is gonna, we're going to have to really wrestle with this issue. Um, and I think we're just beginning to see it now as we go forward. Just beginning. Are there, are there any best practices at Google that other people should replicate? Or are you seeing best practices elsewhere that you think Google should replicate? Uh, anything that is, should become a standard, really, for all of us? Well, I think there are two big things you worry about, um, or, or perhaps three. One is this whole issue of uh, explicability. Why did this AI system reach this conclusion? Uh, that's particularly important when we go into the medical area, where, in fact, I think some of the best hope lies in the medical area, not only, not only for those of us in the developed world that might get access to uh, better treatment and better diagnosis of many complex diseases. The, the misdiagnosis rate, if you include also a delayed diagnosis, is very high in the medical field. So we could improve that. But think about somebody living in a remote part of Africa that may not see a physician in their entire life and may see a nurse once every five years. Imagine if I could diagnose their disease and get them the medical treatment they needed in a country that otherwise is underserved by, by, by modern medicine. That's a great opportunity. So we like to think about how do you make those things occur, but when you begin to think about medical diagnosis, you want explicability. Secondly, uh, privacy and anonymization of data. Critical, critical issue, particularly going, coming back to healthcare. If people are going to share their healthcare records for the purpose of improving medical AI systems, they're going to want to know that they have anonymity, that their data is sufficiently anonymized that we can't go back and track them. Uh, a third is the, is the kind of the related issue of privacy and decision making and how that occurs and how much information do you have about me? How long do you keep it? And I think you know, this is an area Europe has wrestled with uh, to a much greater degree than the US. Um, uh, Europe also wrestles with this issue of speech and the boundaries of free speech. In the, in the US, the First Amendment is a very broad defining item uh, and we, we you know, we see now the conflict between the First Amendment and speech, which we consider intolerant and unacceptable socially, even if it's legal. 
Right. Coming back to the health example, I think you're completely right to point out that health is one of the big promise areas, and yet it's also a treacherous ground, right? So for the book, we interviewed African entrepreneurs, for instance, and you know the prospect of, let's say, Western, white Western physicians and data scientists and engineers designing uh, health AI for African communities is a little uncomfortable for them, right? because there are a lot of values tied up in healthcare, just think about female reproductive health, et cetera, that a Western doctor, especially a male, a white doctor, might have very different biases on than an African doctor in a local environment. How do you innovate when things get so locally specific and values bound? You know, how do you ensure that you're being ethical there? You know, I think actually the, the right thing is to think about the AI system as an amplifier of human capability. So if I, if I get some really serious diagnosis, sure, I want to see all the computer data, but I want to sit down with the doctor and have, and have her look me in the eye and tell me I have this really serious disease and here's why I have it, and here's, but here's how we're going to treat it and here's how we're going to. I don't want to just talk to a computer who says, well, this is a serious disease you leave and the odds that you live for more than three years are Boom. That doesn't sound like a great experience. Um, so I think there, there, AI is the amplifier. Right. Same is true about education, the use of AI. The, the right thing to do is to say, well, we're not going to replace all the teachers. We're going to figure out how to make that teacher better by using AI-based mechanisms that understand student learning, for example. We've got to, that's where we have to move. And I think the same applies in Africa. They may not get to see a doctor in Africa, but they might get to see a nurse that would then give them this data and explain what's happening and why, what, how they have to approach treatment in that situation, and would add the cultural understanding that's critical in that in, in that. Or at least somebody through a telemedicine system that yes. is African that can get a little closer to the value system uh, Absolutely. in place. In place. Absolutely. So, so what I'm hearing from you is keep the human in the loop, Right? Uh, there's, there's a symbiosis of the human and the, and the AI. The AI shouldn't take over from right. the human. And that'll be a very fine balance. It right? will be a fine balance. Same with weapon systems, right? You and I have talked about this offline. What, where do you see uh, treacherous ground for corporate leaders there, right? Because it's so easy to weaponize civilian, off-the-shelf commercial product in AI. Yeah, I, I think the real problem is that AI is the ultimate dual-use technology. I mean, uh, computers are in general the ultimate dual-use technology, but AI especially because of its ability to accelerate decision-making. Um, I think that's very treacherous territory. And I think how we're going to deal with um, the danger of robot armies and attacks by autonomous vehicles and autonomous weapons, I think is something that is better dealt with in a negotiation, peace-setting conference, then it probably is by arguing you're somehow going to pass a rule which will prevent that technology from spreading. And it, it, it's, a very, it's a very delicate line you walk because there are good uses of technology in defensive situations that you would like to permit somehow and say, but you can't do the offensive side. But of course, the same thing. The ability to recognize that there's a missile coming in and you should take some evasive maneuver um, is the same ability you might use to detect that there's a plane flying by that you could shoot out of the sky. So the, the line between offensive and defensive is, disappears. Yeah, it's of course gets particularly hairy. We heard uh, yesterday the uh, Zeit uh, Stiftung uh, and the Magna Carta people talk about, you know, can the AI figure out what is a, what is a meeting of terrorists versus what's a wedding, yeah. right? Uh, and, uh, and, and to some degree, AI can help by recognizing certain patterns, but at the end of the day, there, there has to be a human making some value judgments. Yeah, so there was an interesting example that uh, occurred uh, with this where the Defense Department was interested in. Could they tell by monitoring the path of a vehicle taken around a city that in fact that, that truck, that panel truck coming at a checkpoint or some other crowded scene might contain a bomb in it. Mm. So, and, and there you're not, you're not gonna blow it up, but maybe you're gonna surround it and stop the vehicle before it enters a really congested area or a pedestrian area or something else. 
Um, there's an interesting, that's an interesting problem and one you'd really like to solve somehow. Mm. Um, we still don't have a good solution for the, the determined terrorist who is willing to have forfeit their own life can still do significant damage in our societies. So figuring out whether or not we can get a technology to deal with that, whether or not we like the implications of that, whether or not we're comfortable with what it does to people's privacy and things, I think is a question we're going to have to, we're going to, have to wrestle with. And, and the very uncomfortable trade-offs. Right? Uncomfortable trade-offs. Uncomfortable trade-offs. Well, walk, walk the streets of the city of London now. Go in the, go in the tube. Yeah. You're on TV. Yeah. Well, you didn't have to travel to London, uh, Los Angeles, right? Los the Angeles Sheriff's now. Department is using facial recognition cameras on highways. Right. I remember testifying a year and a half ago in Sacramento uh, about these types of things, and the Sheriff's Department had a representative there that said, look, you want us to fight crime, and you want us to stay ahead of the criminals, but you don't want us to have the technology they already use. And it's a very, obviously, you know, the answer is guidelines and governance and frameworks, but, you know, when it comes down to a working level, it's a very, very, it's a very tough difficult thing problem. to do. Difficult yeah. problem. Yeah. It seems like, uh, by the way, uh, drifting into sort of the white elephant in the room, which is China, right? Um, uh, and uh, it seems that they have found their own compromise, and I'm overgeneralizing, I'm bound to overgeneralize here, but that which is in the interest of, of stability, uh, you know, one could extend that sentence by saying, and in favor of the current political regime, okay, uh, is worthy of compromise. Meaning, uh, you know, with autonomous cars, there is allegedly a 2% tolerance rate for accidents in trials of autonomous cars. Well, that could theoretically mean out of 100 trials, there is two dead, there, there is, there's two incidents where there is dead people there, right? But it seems like China overall, and certainly the regime in Beijing, have made that very uncomfortable uh, uh, compromise. Uh, whereas we won't, you know, for us, the tolerable threshold is zero, right? Zero people. Although we tolerate lots of people having accidents on the road, right? 40,000 so, a year. Yeah, yes. exactly. In America alone, 40,000 exactly. a year, right? Yeah. And so, so the argument could be, well, the Chinese have a greater tolerance, which is morally uh, fraught for us, but they're going to get there quicker and then save more lives later, right? How do you deal with that when you're at the helm of Google? You want to drive forward and get to the good side, but you know, in the bridge in between, you're going to have to make some very morally difficult compromises. Well, I think, I think if you look at Waymo, you see, a, you see a company that has technology that is already far better than what's available from virtually anybody else, but is, is not as close to matching human drivers. By human drivers, I mean somebody between the ages of 30 and 50 who is 100% awake, uh, hasn't had a drink, um, and isn't distracted by a cell phone. I, I, one of the most fascinating things is um, the most frequent accident for a Waymo car is being rear-ended. And guess what's in the hands of more than half the people who rear-end that Waymo? You got it, a cell phone, every single time. So, it's, so we already can accomplish that. I think we can get even better, um, and we can do better than young drivers, than drivers who are over 65, especially if it's at night. Um, Etc. So you know, there's a there there's a, a kind of craft there. What we have to accept is that humans are imperfect. And how are we going to deal with the technology that is meant to act? It's artificial intelligence. It's meant to act like humans act. So once it reaches a certain level, I think we're going to have to accept that technology is good enough for deployment. Yeah. The problem, of course, being that many people perceive themselves to be better drivers of course than they, they objectively do. are. Right? Most pilots should take their yes. hands off the landing and the takeoff instrument and let the plane do the job because the plane can do the job better yeah. than most pilots. Yeah. And pilots are highly trained. So. Yeah. Some engineers say if all cars were autonomous, that, that would be a lot lower risk than some car Much autonomous, lower. some yeah, cars it, it human, would be. Right? It would be. It would be. Yeah. I mean, I think irrational behavior. I mean, the, uh, one, some crazy things have occurred. So. Um, it was a Waymo car driving, uh, and somebody ran a stoplight at 80 miles an hour in a 40 mile an hour zone. Most humans, most humans would have had an accident in that situation because they had a green light, they would have gone ahead. The, the Waymo vehicle saw it, skidded, and ended up with a minor fender bender rather than a life threatening, but in most cases, people would have been killed. Yeah. 
Well, California is at the forefront of autonomous driving experiments. Uh, Germany plays a key role in that area as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, of course, uh, California has the driving factor that we just legalized marijuana. So we're probably going to be even faster <laughs> with autonomous cars. So yeah, now they're going to have to give a THC test. As yes. Well. <laughs> no, it's not just the phone, but also the joint. Um, okay. <laughs>